Okay, so I'm Naomi Altman. Um, oh, do you want to do an introduction? Oh, sorry, Nina's going to do an introduction. Yes. Well, it's great to be here, and I, I have to start by saying that uh, I really do more with uh, gene expression than with protein expression. Uh, Olga keeps dragging me to conferences and short courses, hoping that I will learn something about protein expression, but in between time, I always forget. Um, but fortunately, the statistical methods that are used are very similar across both, and actually, Nina has set up perfectly for what comes next, which is multiple testing. Um, so in my talk, what you need to think is that you already ran LIMA or you already ran DEP2, and you have, for every comparison you want to do, a p-value for every feature, which in your case will be a protein, but in my case, it's usually a gene, uh, an RNA type expression. Okay, but it doesn't matter. Uh, there are different features for some of the data, but the statistical methods are the same. So I'm going to start by, say, by asking a question, because if you don't understand what a p-value is, then the rest of this isn't going to be very exciting. So what is a p-value? Close, OK? The probability of observing a value of your test statistic that's more extreme or more extreme than you observe under certain conditions. I don't know what that condition is. Pardon me? Not normal distribution. Not what? Not the null hypothesis. Not hypothesis. Well, I'll come back to the null in a minute. The null hypothesis says that you set up something Usually, that there's no difference between conditions, or that something is not present, or so on. Um, and you're testing your, it's a kind of funny, backwards way of looking at the data. You say, what do you expect to see if the thing I'm not even interested in is true? Okay. And then, if it's very extreme, you're going to say, oh, I have a significant result. Now, the normal distribution, where does the normal distribution come in? The normal distribution is a requirement of the biological replicates within each condition if you're going to use t-test or lima. Okay? Otherwise, it doesn't matter. If you're using some other kind of test, you need to have the condition, the data has to come from the appropriate condition for that test. So for example, for DEP2, you have plant data, it's certainly not normally distributed. Um, you're supposed to come from a distribution called the nucleus binomial, which is just a count there. Um, okay, so that's a p-value. It's the probability of seeing the test statistic at least as extreme as the one you observe when there's really no effect. And what's the power? Power? Let's get it in sort of probabilistic terms. It's the probability of. Pardon me? It's the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. So, therefore, some alternative hypothesis is true. Hopefully, the one that you posited as the alternative. Okay. So, these are going to be really important. Um, so, the problems we're going to be dealing with today are exactly the kind of problems that Olga was talking about when I walked in, about what happens when you have very, a lot of data, high dimensional data, many, many features, proteins, genes, whatever they are, uh, and you try to look at them all at once. And you can consider the background here as 
at each pixel having a hypothesis. Now hidden in this background are the true positive thrusts. I defy anybody to find them. Usually there's five of them. Okay? I'll give you a hint. There's one right here. <laughs> okay? But if you take the background away, you can see it. But the problem is that all these high throughput methods, we test everything. Right? So if we had a very focused hypothesis, we would look at just the one or two proteins that we know are involved in the process, but we wouldn't have to do any of this stuff that I'm talking about. We're going to do it because we're doing these high throughput screens, and there's so much noise, and we can't see what's going on. Now, why couldn't we see these guys? We couldn't see them because they're not a very big effect compared to everything else that's going on, right? So if they were really big, bright red spots, you'd see them. But they aren't. Okay. So, let's start with this. Suppose we have 10,000 <coughs> hypotheses, that is, proteins, creatures, genes, whatever we are caring about, and the knowledge is true, so there's no difference uh, in our conditions. And as suppose we declare, we reject at p less than some value alpha, say 0.05. How many rejections do we expect and how many of them are false? So first, how many, under this situation, how many rejections would you expect? That's, okay, so some people said nine, let's say nine, five, five. <laughs> Alpha times uh, 10,000. With me, so if it's 5%, we're going to reject 500. And how many of those are false rejections? Everyone. Okay. I hope we all get that. They're all false rejections because the novel is always true in this case. So. Typically, hopefully, in our experiments, that's not the case. Nothing is going on. We wouldn't have done the experiment. Um, <coughs> well, at least we hope that we're looking at the right set of features. Um, so let's suppose that the null <coughs> is true for um, 9,000 of them. So 10% of them are, you know, really, there's really an effect. And that's what we want to try and find in all the background. We're going to find. 9,000 times alpha tests that are rejected falsely. Um, and this is going to cost us a lot, especially if we have to do lab experiments to solve a lot of these. So let's just have a look at this. Um, so, well, before we do that, we have to look at beta as well, the power. Okay, so how many of the 1,000 true hypo, true alternatives will we find? Beta is the power. Okay, so typically we'd say we design experiments so we reject that alpha less than p less than 0 0.05, and we want the power to be about 80 percent. So how many true rejections? Will thousand times beta. And those will all be true rejections, right? So none of those will be false. <coughs> but here's the problem. So suppose we reject at P less than 0.05, 80% power, then 450 of the nulls will be rejected. And 800 of the alternatives will be 
rejected. The total rejections is 450 plus 800, that's 1250. And the false discovery rate or proportion is about 450 over 1250, that's 36%. So we're running around in our lab, you know, putting out money, trying to understand how these proteins are working, but <coughs> only two thirds of them are actually involved in the process of researching. One third of them are total garbage from our point of view. Now, what about the converse? What about the false non discovery? Right? We're going to find some things that aren't there. We're also going to admit some things that are there. Right? Well, the true non discoveries will be the other 8550 up in the north. And there'll be non discoveries, there'll be 200 of the 1,000 alternatives. So the non discovery rate. Okay, well, I'll just say this right now. I think I have a slide. I think I have a slide out of order. So one of the questions I've been asking since the first day I heard about this stuff is, why do we care about non false discoveries? What about false non discoveries? Why don't we look at the total error? Okay. So and here's my perspective on this, quite honestly. In some cases, when we're looking at the biology of a process, what we're looking for is a few interesting follow up in the lab. We don't want them to be false discoveries. But if we're screening through agents, you know, that might cure cancer or something, we're gonna the ones we don't discover we just throw out and we never look at it again. So that's important too. Right? But people have always assumed that most of the features <coughs> are not important to the process. And therefore the non discovery rate, false non discovery rate probably small. Things aren't there to be discovered. But that's not true in every case. Okay, so you really have to ask yourself what the process that you're looking at uh, <coughs> should do. So, for example, in some cancers, there'll be hugely different uh, profiles in the normal versus cancer picture. And in that case, you ought to be looking at non discovery, false non discovery, as well as false discovery. Okay. So, for this talk, I'm only going to Okay, any questions or concerns so far? Now, when you're concerned about <coughs> false discoveries, you can't have a false discovery if everything came from the alternative, right? So it's nice to know how, ma how many or what percentage of the features come from the null. So one of the things I always do is look at the histogram of p-values. So let's consider that histogram of p-values. What is, suppose everything is null, you have 10,000 features, you do a test for each one, and you get p-values from your test, what is that histogram? Should it look like? Okay, how many people think it should look normal? Okay, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say that. How many people think it have some have no clue what it should look like? <laughs> oh, this class is very shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some people want to hazard a guess. So, uh, okay, yeah. Now we have, how many people agree that it should be flat, pretty flat? How many people disagree? Okay, so let's think about this. What percentage of the tests have the p-value less than 0.01? 1%, right? How about less than 0.02? 2%. 2%. 
How about between 0.01 and 0.02? It's gotta be 1%, right? What about between 0.02 and 0.03? 1%. What about between 0.95 and 0.5? Of 1%. So it's gonna be flat, right? So that's by the definition of the p-value. And what we're gonna do, and I always end up talking too much, but we're, we're gonna have a lab and we're gonna generate p-values and you'll see what you get, okay? Um, so here's one where I simulated data with no differential expression. And this is what it looks like, it's pretty flat. Um, it's not completely flat because, you know, it's got randomness in it, okay? Uh, but it's pretty flat. Now what about the alternative? The p-values from the alternative, what do they look like? I think you have to tell me. Yeah. It should be heavily skewed. Now I can never remember whether when people talk about skew, whether they're talking about the tail or the peak. Yeah. But the peak should be close to zero or one or what? Close to zero. Right? That's what you hope for because those are the significant ones so they should have small p-values. And we can't actually answer those questions for the alternatives because we don't know what they come from. Right? We don't have a, usually we have a single hypothesis that there's no difference uh, for the <coughs> null, but for the alternative it could be any size difference. It could be different, a different difference for each feature. Right? So we don't really know, but it should be mostly near zero. So uh, here's an example from the simulation you're going to do where they all have a very strong effect. Okay, so the ones that we're going to actually discover will be over here, and then these ones out here will be non-discoveries because they have big feedback. But of course, when you're doing the test, you don't know which one, when you're doing it really, not for simulation, you don't know which ones come from the null and which ones come from the alternative. So what you get to see is this histogram here, which has everything. And I put this line here where I stuck one on top of the other one. Okay, and everything down here came from the null and everything up there came from the alternative. Well, not quite everything came from the null. Bumpy. And not everything above it came from the alternative because I put it down too low, which is this or that one. Right? Um, but basically, these are the nulls. And over here, where it's the small p values, you know, you can see these are false discoveries, these are true discoveries. <coughs> the only problem is you don't know which features they came from. Any questions or comments about that? So here are some pictures from a real microarray study that I did. They look just like that. And I always, always, always do these plots because sometimes you do things and they don't look like that. So what's this? This came from a kind of microarray on which instead of uh, RNA, so instead of cDNAs on the array, they were antigens, and uh, proteins were supposed to bind to these antigens. And I ran them through lemma, just as if everything was normally distributed, um, which it wasn't. And so I showed this to the guys who created the array, and they said, oh, we bet you normalized the data just as if it was in expression data, but you can't and I would have just, if I hadn't drawn this histogram, I would have just kept going, doing exactly what Mina did an hour ago. And I would never have noticed that the data was total garbage. Not the data was probably not garbage, but the way I handled the data was, made it, it turned it into garbage. Okay, I always do this plot. And <clears throat> right before we end today, I'll show you some other plots where 
I think I did everything right, but the data still looks pretty, the p value still looks pretty weird. So I just want to emphasize this plot, this is a histogram of p values, not of the original data. So it should be flat with the peak at zero. I have no idea why it came out so bad. I've never seen anything quite this bad, but probably because um, most of the antigens didn't have anything bind to them. They were looking for immune system proteins, and if the uh, individual wasn't exposed to the agent, then they didn't have the proteins. Um, and then normalization just totally messed it up. Okay. So the first thing I always do is try to understand whether I have a lot of <coughs> nulls or not. And a lot of the studies that I've been doing have to do with tissue development uh, in plants. We have a lot of differential expression. A flower doesn't look anything like a leaf. Okay? Now, if I was looking instead at leaves that were, say, exposed to ozone or not, I might expect a much less differential expression. So I really need to know this in order to understand what I'm getting at with all the uh, And it's actually pretty simple if the histogram looks right to estimate the uh, percentage, the proportion of null tests, um, basically it's this area under here um, compared to the entire area. Okay? And how can I tell where this line goes? Well, one way to do it is just to drop it down until it's a flat line. It has to be flat. Um, and somewhere from, you know, from 0.5 to 1, those are almost all nulls, so it should be kind of sitting on top of the bars there. Pretty simple. Um, so there's two very simple and pretty accurate methods. They work well for count data and for uh, intensity data. Story's method uses that area to compute where the flat part is, and then compute the area under the flat part. And the pounds and chin method does uh, something kind of interesting. If, if it's totally flat, then the average p-value should be 0.5. Uh, so two times the average p-value is 1. And so uh, anyway, the flat area, m0 is about two times the total number of tests times and that would assume that all the non-nulls have p-values actually equal to zero, which won't be true, but, you know, it's not too bad. It's an estimate. Um, neither of these estimates give you whole numbers for M0, but that's okay because most of the, usually you use um, your estimate of the pro proportion, M0 over M, so you don't even notice that you don't have a whole number. So we're going to try these with our in our simulation, you, you get very close to the same answer. Okay, so here's the situation. Um, we're doing M tests. Um, <coughs> we have the red are the errors, the blue are what's correct. M0 is um, the total number of true nulls. Uh, sometimes we call the total number of alternatives. M1, so we say M minus M0. And the total errors is T plus V. That is, you didn't notice that it was significant when you should have, or you called it significant when it's from the null. And the false discovery proportion is the number of rejections that came actually from the nulls over the total number of rejections. Okay. So the usual approach is to try to control that the expected percentage of false discoveries. And we already talked about why they do that. I would say it's not the right approach if most of your features are expected to be differential. Okay. So before 1995, what people tried to do was to control the probability 
of seeing, making evil moments good. And that was fine because at that time people were maybe testing five or 20 features, but not 20,000. <coughs> So this is called the family-wise error rate. Um, and the most famous method that you've probably all heard of is the von Ferroni method. And the von Ferroni method is sometimes called an omnibus method because you don't really need a whole lot of assumptions to make it be accurate. So what you do is, instead of rejecting at level alpha, 0.05, reject that alpha divided by n. So if m is 10,000, then you reject for p less than 0.05 and determine 1,000. Okay. So how many rejections do you expect? Well, it'll be 10,000 times this. So you expect less than one rejection, right? You expect, uh, you expect every 20 times that you do this with 10,000 features, you'll have a rejection. Um, but what happens to the power? So if you set things up at 80% power at point when you reject for 0 0.05, your power is going to go up or down? It's going to go way down because you need a huge effect to get such a small p value. And most of the effects you're going to see aren't going to be that. Um, the method, let's see, Mina used p.adjust, right? So it computes an adjusted p-value, and the von Ferroni adjusted p-value is the minimum of um, the number of tests times the ordinary p-value, and one. So one of the questions I used to get asked a lot, but I think people have either they've given up asking me or they kind of got it figured out is, before I did an adjustment, my p was equal to 0.0001, and that looks very significant to me. But after adjustment, it said it's not significant. Well, you know, you multiply that by 10,000, and you're up to one already. That's not very significant. Questions about that? So, as I said, though, you don't have to, you can't get a false discovery if your feature actually came from the alternative. So really, you don't have to um, divide by m. You can divide by m0. Okay, and that's one reason why we might want to estimate m0. But you know what? In this case, if you divide by 9,000 instead of 10,000, it's not going to help you. So there's a more powerful me method uh, that's also found wise. It was uh, created by this guy called Holm. And it uses the sor sorted p-value. And for the smallest p-value, you, you divide itself over m. But if you're able to reject that one, then you say, oh, I don't have 10,000 nulls. I only have 9,999 nulls. So for the next one, I'll divide by that, by 9999. And then the next one will be 9998, and so on. Okay? So, and it also controls the family-wise error rate. And I have no idea why we don't teach this in STAT 100, because it's not any harder than von Ferroni, and it's more powerful. But we don't, for some reason. And it's very intuitive, in my opinion, as well. And I never heard of it until I started looking into this literature after the microarray revolution. But anyway. Mm -hmm. 
But in 1995, two things happened that changed life for, for high-throughput data. The first was that we had the first microarray, which was the first high-throughput data for uh, biologists. And the second was that Benjamin Ian Hopper said, why would we care about controlling, about finding no mistakes whatsoever when we're doing thousands of tests, why don't we consider instead the false discovery rate? That is, the proportion of tests where we reject and we make a mistake. Because if we're doing thousands of tests, we've got to expect to make a few mistakes, we've got a few false discoveries, and we don't really care about that as long as most of what we do is true. So that also happened in 1995, just a nice convergence of things. And this nasty looking thing here says we want to control Q, which is the, here's that proportion of false discoveries, but you can't divide by the number of discoveries if that's zero, so the rest of it's just the, you know, math jargon for adjusting for that. Okay. So what they showed in their 1995 paper, which is probably one of the most cited papers in statistics these days, is that if you reject when the, if you sort them, just like in the Holmes procedure, and then when the i smallest one is less than this target, which is usually 0.05 times i over the number of tests, then you control the FDR at one Q. Now that doesn't mean that for the particular experiment that you're looking at now, and you guarantee that you'll have less than 5% false discoveries if you use this procedure without this Q of 0.05. What it says is if you use this, if everybody uses this procedure, then if you average over everybody, there will be 5%. But nevertheless, it's not too bad. It's, you know, it's like everything else, it's a statistic. Okay, so that's what they showed. And P dot adjust and other software that give you an adjusted p value. Most of the software that gives you adjusted p values uses Benjamin and Hopper. And what they do is they retort either one, if this number is bigger than one, or they cross multiply to give you an estimate of q. So that's what you get. And the same thing can happen. You can have very small p-values. Well, what will happen in this case if this is the smallest p-value? Well, if this is the smallest p-value, then it will have an adjusted, Benjamin and Hooke group is adjusted p-value of one, and all the people won't go up to one, no matter, you know, they'll all be doing this. However, this is actually um, a much less conservative, uh, much more powerful procedure if you have at least one rejection than the family wide ones. Because it's not guarding you against having any uh, errors whatsoever, but that the proportion of errors will come down. So you can have an error, but only a small proportion of errors. And just as for the Bonferroni method, you don't have to adjust for the ones that are truly um, from the alternative. So if you know, if you can estimate M0, you can stick that in instead. And <clears throat> that's a smaller number than M. So this is a smaller adjusted p-value, so therefore more speed. Now, I sometimes use Benjamin and Hopper, uh, and it works really well if M0 is close to M. But as I mentioned, in a lot of the studies I do, M0 is, is only about two-thirds or even a half of M. And so it's still pretty conservative even if you adjust. So I like the story method. The story method is very intuitive. 
Suppose I decide to reject at this p-value. Okay. The false discovery rate is this area over the total height of the two bars where I reject. So the story method estimates this. Uh, you get to see how many rejections there are. And then it um, plugs in the p-value, and that gives you your estimated SDR, and that's called the q-value. Okay, before we go on, is, are there any questions about any of this stuff? Yes. Um, do you have the uh, identification measurements that you showed in the previous slide? Do you also show the standard deviation? Yes. And how do you see that? Sure. The section here is simply on the standard deviation. This is the standard deviation of the score. And actually, um, there is some crossover in that sometimes people use spike ends uh, that come from, they can either, you know, if you're spiking in, you can either, you can decide whether they should come from the alternative or from the null. And then you can see whether your false detection rate on your spike in um, matches what you expect from uh, this p value type analysis. But spiking in is very similar to the some of the methods that you're using in identification um, to, to find false positives. Okay, but as to this, remember we talked about identification, right? And the motivation of the standard. And you said that it's a good idea to do for one standard and do the normalization and other one for the check for the identification score. Well, you can check the score as well, right? And the standard is the same. So you would have to go some way to see the difference between the two standards. Okay, so <coughs> what we're going to do now is a hands-on exercise. Um, everybody thought they wanted to do something. Yeah. Okay, so you should, you should have the file I'm going to bring up in R, and hopefully, I haven't do, run it on this computer, so hopefully it'll run on this computer. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, simulate some data with 9,000 features from the null because we simulated them, so we know that. and 10,000 features that all come from the same alternative, which you will never see in real data. Um, and we'll look at our estimates of pi zero. So pi zero should be 9,000 over 10,000, right? So 0.9. Um, and then we'll look at these three methods, Bonferroni, uh, Benjaminian Hochberg, the, the regular Benjaminian Hochberg, the one that usually happens. Uh, and two values. Yeah. Um, how should I use the values of P and No. Thank you for asking that. The Q value. Okay. So basically, all of these methods can be thought of as you take the P values that came out of your test and you move down to much smaller values and then you adjust and you reject at that small value. So the Bonferroni method actually creates an adjusted p-value. It's the probability of, of having at least one rejection when you've done this many tests under those circumstances in the row and The other two methods, the things that are called adjusted p-values, um, are actually estimates of the false discovery rate. So although R and some of the other literature call them adjusted p-values. 
they are actually estimates of health disparities. And the Q value, that's one, one reason we use Q instead of adjusted P value, is to be able to see it. However, if you use stories method, and it gives you something called an adjusted P value, Find a p value, and that same person can get from the Berlin Hospital, but they have that information. So that's the difference. It's the information that really is the health data. But, it's, but, but all this is totally right from the operational point of view. We set our target between 0 0.05 or 0 0.01, and after whatever <coughs> adjustment we do, that's where we create our. Now you've asked a good question. <laughs> okay, so, and I don't know how far I want to get into the answer, the, the technical answer to your question. Um, so, whenever we talk about p-values, we're talking about something called frequentist uh, statistics, which basically means if you did a whole bunch of tests, what percentage of them would be wrong? Which time would you be wrong? So when you start talking about posterior probabilities, you're talking about a different interpretation of statistics where you can say the probability. Okay, so in a, to a frequentist, this pair of glasses is either black or it's not black. Okay. And if, you know, if I'm taking some glasses, glasses out of a drawer, there's no question about talking about the probability that they're black. Because they either are or they're not. But if you're a baby, then you get to say, um, well, you know, there were a thousand pairs of glasses in this drawer, and five percent of them were black, and so, you know, um, there's a five percent chance that it's black. Okay, so, um, so these two methods have a an interpretation in terms of not the black. And Black and not black, but it's just the, the probability that a hypothesis is black. And this one does not. Um, but these two can both be looked at as posterior probabilities based on, say, individual over M. If you, if you didn't know which hypothesis was which, here's the probability that a randomly selected hypothesis. Actually, we've done that a lot in Morrow's talk because in Morrow's talk, and it's 
talk about introducing research and having people figure out in order to function, and this is one observation of how stressing can be physical key values to be exactly the same. Okay. Let's let's do what we do with some data, and then we can talk about the uh, some of the philosophical ends of things tomorrow, hopefully, and confuse things more. Okay, so what you need to do is bring up our studio with let's see. Okay, bring up our studio with this thing called simulation.rmd. So. Okay. Okay, we don't really need this very much. Okay, um, what I always do is I use projects. Did you talk about projects? No. Okay, so one of the problems when you're doing a lot of different uh, analyses is your R workspaces get written on top of each other. So to avoid that, uh, you can do this, which I'm going to do for you, and you could do it too. Um, so I'm going to create a project, and that, what that's going to basically do is create a new R workspace for you. And then when, if you wanted to redo some of this simulation study, you would open this project, and everything that we've already done would be there in that project. And the stuff that you did with LIM and VEC would not be there. Um, so I'm going to start a project in an existing directory, which is the Okay, and then I'm going to open up my RMD file again because I should have done this first. Uh, open file, recent file, simulation RMD. Okay. Blue is okay and red is help. <laughs> okay, good. Blue is cool. <laughs> red is panic. Yes, I understand. Red is panic. Got it. But fortunately, Nina and Olga are here to help me with the panic. Okay. So, um, basically, the way I like to use our uh, the RMD files is that if you just were to click on the, um, let's see, on the knit thing, you'll get a document that has all the text that I had and all the commands and all that. Um, but what I don't want you to do that because then you don't get to see what the commands are, right? Um, so you know, we're going to work through this, and most people will work at their own pace. Might be slower. Um, and here's the idea. Out there, there are statisticians and data scientists and machine learning people in this mill, all creating wonderful algorithms, and most of us have no idea what they do. Okay? And for simple things like t tests, um, the mathematical statisticians have gone through and done theory, and they can actually tell you what it does, although. You know, depending on your background, you may or may not be able to follow all that, but that's okay, you know, because you know how to use it. But with all this new stuff, some of it's so complicated that we could never 
figure it out, even with even the most brilliant mathematicians. And so the purpose of a simulation study is to run something through where you know the answers, and then you can see how well this method is getting the known answers. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to create a data set that's got 9,000 features that are known to not be differential. Um, and 1,000 that are known to be differential, and I made it really simple, but if you want to make it more complicated, that's easy. Just change a few things in the simulation. You want to have 100% non-differential? You can do that. You want to have 100% that actually are differential, so they should all be significant? You can give it a try. I think you'll find that the what you call it methods, that these multiple testing methods will die if you do that, but, um, but it's you know, it might be worth trying. Okay, you want to have so so that's the idea. So what we're going to do is make synthetic data, um, which sometimes is called an in silico experiment, uh, meaning on the chip. And okay, and then we and what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to compute the story method. Story estimate of pi zero, pi zero point nine in our study right now. The uh, pound and chen estimate, and we're just going to see how well they do. Um, oops, I've got an M there that doesn't belong because I said pi zero, not M zero. And then we're going to look at how many. Uh, discoveries, false discoveries, false non-discoveries, we get using ordinary p-values, von Peroni method, Sandini, Hochberg method, and q-values. So that's the idea. So the first thing we got to do is get the p-values. And if I had known for sure that we were going to do lemma and all that beforehand, we could have just made our data, made up the data, and then run it through Lima. But I wasn't sure about that. So um, what I do first is write a little function right here, which you should all do, because otherwise you won't be able to do the rest of it, um, which gets the p-value out of the p-test. And that's what we can use apply, <coughs> like Mina uh, did earlier. She used best apply and she used ordinary apply. So uh, you need to write this little function right here, this one that is the code. Um, since I have text and code embedded together, what you need to do is go down to that piece of code and run it. Oops, my first function. Um, and when you're going to use apply, it's very important that your function have uh, the first argument, which is x, because apply looks for x um, to run. And what this is going to be, these will be the expression values, which will be intensities. And this will be what the condition is of treatment. So in our case, we're going to only have, we're going to do t-tests. So there's only, there's a control and a treated. That's it. So what we're going to do is uh, create some gene expression data or uh, protein expression data, intensities, and after taking log, those don't say they're approximately normal. They're usually normal enough, so the t-test is appropriate. We're just going to make them normal by um, creating normal, creating them as normal. And what we're going to do is. Um, we're going to assume that there are biological reps, uh, and I set everything up down here. So five biological reps in the treated, five biological reps in the control, and if I want to change it to 10 or 3, all I have to do is change N SAM. Okay. Um, NF is the number of features. 
uh, which is going to be just like my slide, 10,000. Uh, M0, the number of nulls, 9,000. Um, and then, what is the t-test uh, test? Well, we test the difference in the mean. And although this is very unrealistic, uh, since there's a difference in mean, if there's no difference in mean, it doesn't matter if the mean is 8 or 28. Right? But you're going to subtract the two means and you get 0. Anyway. So I just assume all the nulls have mean 8. And the alternatives, I'm going to assume, have mean 10 to one number. And the reason I picked that number is if you only have one test, and if you have five samples and standard deviation one, even though I called it sig, it should be up to me, but anyway, I called it sig, so it's sigma. Um, if the SC is one, then that gives you exactly power of point. So all of our alternatives are going to have this mean. And all we're going to, the first little code chunk creates the controls. They all have mean 8. And they all have standard deviation 1, and they're all normally distributed. And what I do is I put them in a big matrix, which is 10,000 rows for the features and five columns. And then I create another little matrix that's the ones that comes from the null. They have the same mean and standard deviation, so I do exactly the same thing, except there's only 9,000 nulls. And finally, I create the alternatives. They look exactly the same, except they have a mean of 10. And then I just mush the whole thing together to make one big matrix, which looks a lot like what you would see in an intensity expression matrix, except that in this case, the first 9,000 we know are all nulls, and the last 1,000 we know are Everybody got that? So you can go to the code chunk and just run it. And if you have any questions about the code chunk, you got to run this one too. So I usually run it using run next code chunk. <coughs> and that puts me down here. And then I just go through and generate those matrices. And then I smush everything together. Is everybody with me? Smush everything together. So one matrix has 10,000 rows, and then the other one are 9,000 and 1,000. So the first thing I do is smush the rows together using R bind. And now I have two matrices that have 10,000 rows, and I push the columns together. Okay, so that's the next little piece. And now I have 10,000 features, proteins, genes, whatever, um, and 10 samples. And as Nina said, Lima and other programs don't know which samples come from what, so we need to get have a treatment vector um, with 10 entries. We know, we, we always know, we should know where our samples came from. So in this case, the first five samples came from the controls, and the other five came from the treated. And that's the next little code chunk right here. Okay, and if I was running lemma, um, then the next thing I would just run lemma, I would use my sim1 data would be what you put in for the expression values, and I would create the design matrix using this vector. But since I'm not running lemma, but I'm doing t-tests, what I have to do is for each row, I need to stick in the row as x and put in the treatment to say which ones come from treatments. So 
I, I'm a terrible programmer, so I always check it out. Um, so what I did here in the next little piece was I ran the first feature uh, as an ordinary, just using t.test. Um, so the first thing I did was run it as xy, and the next thing I did was I ran it as a statement to make sure I had the vector right and get the same p value. And then I used my new function tp just to get the p value to make sure it all matches. I'm paranoid because I make lots of mistakes. Um, so, uh, here it is the first time, P is 0.065, here it is with the treatments, 0.065, and here it is with TP, 0.065, so I'm happy with my TP function, okay, and this is just to get the P value. Yours will be different, I hope. Did anybody get the same number as I got? <laughs> okay. Because um, that's the other thing. Um, to, to do this right, each of us would have to do the simulation over and over again. But there's, I don't know, 30 people in the class. So we get 30 trials of the simulation for free, basically. And if we had little clickers, we could all put in our p values and all that would be fun. But anyway, we can't do that. Um, okay, so now all I do is I get my p value. Did you talk about Paul? Can I pause it? Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to use the apply function to apply tp to each row of the one of sim1 data, and therefore I will get 10,000 p values. And the first 9,000 came from the null, and the other one, the next 1,000 come from the alternative. So let's do that. This is by far not the best, not the quickest way to do it, but it works. Lemma would be better, and it wouldn't give you the same p values because Lemma doesn't just does an, a slight adjustment to the t test. But. <coughs> So, instead of doing this, I would I would create a design <coughs> matrix. I can't remember. I can't remember the exact name for design matrix. I would have Lima test design equals my design matrix, and it would come up with all those different columns, like the log full change and all that, and the p value, and adjust. Everything else would just be with that column of p-values. And with p equals 2, the output is in this output table, and you have to find the p-values in the output table. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to try to be... I, I tend to just run on and not look at my notes and then get out of order, so I'm just going to try to stay in order. So the first thing I always do is make sure that I got things that look like p-values. I told you I'm very paranoid. Um, and I think, did you, you talked about the Bagley, it's about the Bagley example? In your, did you talk about the Bagley example in your, we just did a real quick one. Um, the forensic, well, yeah, the, the so anyway, I'm paranoid, and it turns out not paranoid enough. <laughs> um, there were some horrendous cases where people made really silly mistakes in their data, like switching around rows and things like that, uh, getting therefore completely wrong conclusions. So you should be at least as paranoid as me about doing your analysis. Okay. Um, okay. So I always. The head command prints out the first few values, so they should be between 0 and 1 because they're p-values. And remember, the first uh, 9,000 all come from the null, so you would expect to get some big values. If they're all little values, you probably messed up in the simulation. 
in your real data, you don't know where the long moles are. So, but in the simulation, it should. Um, um, so that looks good. Mine or yours will be different, right? Because they're random numbers. Um, and then I do a histogram. And I've got lots of genes, so I like to have lots of classes so I can see some of the detail. And it looks perfect because this is simulated data that's supposed to look perfect, right? And why does it look so perfect? Well, one reason it looks so perfect, besides the fact it's simulated, is that I have very high power in this example, 80% power. If you have less power, then what happens is the peak comes down and kind of spreads out farther along here. Um, so looking at this histogram also tells you how good your power is. If it's, if it's got one really sharp peak at zero, you've got a lot of power. And if it looks like a triangle, you might not find anything, even though your estimate of pi zero will not be 100%. So that looks good. Um, and then the next thing I did was I got the histograms of the nulls and the non-nulls, because I know which ones are which. Oh. Oh, I see. Thank you. You know, this is a new behavior of our studio, and I. Yeah. Yes. This is. And it's probably good, but it maybe <laughs> the first time I encountered it was last week when I uploaded the new <laughs> version. Okay, so there's the non-nulls. They look like they should. And the nulls are over here somewhere. <coughs> and in this particular case, they look a little bizarre. But we know that this is simulated data. So even though, so you know this is an outcome you can get with your real data, right? Um, they should be flatter. But, and if I did it again, they probably would be. How many people have a depression at the beginning? How many people have a little peak at the beginning? How many people have it look flat? Okay, some people aren't doing it. <laughs> Is it? No, it's not, actually. Um, I mean, it's a random number generator, so you should get variability, and you should not get, you should not systematically get more depression <coughs> at one end or the other. Um, the R random number generator is one of the best small. Um, oh, good question. If everybody set their C then you get exactly the same uh, numbers. Not the same as me, because I wouldn't have that same, but you guys would all have the same. And then we would not have 30 different realizations. OK. So they look like they should. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is estimate pi zero, and I'm going to let you guys do this instead of me, because I think you don't do much thing. Um, so the, you know what, I didn't run every single piece of code. The first thing you have to do to run Q values is load it. Um, I'm going to say, let's put in Y. Library. It's in my 
a Sim bioconductor, so you should have already downloaded it. I think. Is it in bio? Yes, it is in bio. If you don't have Q value, what I always do is this. I go to packages, and you should have BIOC installer. So then I go library bio, oops, BIOC installer, and then I say BIOC light. Oops. BIOC light Q value. And if we don't, and we should be able to get it if we don't overload the server. Okay. And then you then you'll have it installed, but you still won't have it available in. Our studio, so you still have to type library Incidentally, our studio has an installer, but I always use BioC Light because I find it does a much better job, even if the stuff is in a bioconductor, it does a better job of finding all the other programs that your program is dependent on and downloading other things. So, in this case, <coughs> it's kind of similar. Okay. <coughs> so, what you want to do is run this, and what Q values does is it actually creates several components. It, it computes the Q values, and it also Say that and figure out what pi zero is, and then we can also estimate pi zero as two times the average Q value. got a value of pi zero that was exactly 0.9. Exactly. Okay, how many people got something that was over 0.92? How many people got something that was below 0.88? How many got something that was between 0.88 and 0.92? Okay, so that's about right. It's a, you know, this is something that comes from the data, which in this case is synthetic data, but that's okay. It's got variant variability, um, and it turns out that in the, the sort of sample size equivalent here is the number of features. So the more features you have, if they're truly independent of each other, which they aren't for proteins, but if they were truly independent of each other, the more features you have, the more accurately you will estimate pi zero. So here we have 10,000 features, and they really are independent because we simulated them independently. Uh, so you get a pretty good estimate. Um, and usually, uh, Q value is designed for these kind of data, and it sh should be a slightly better estimate than uh, the Pounds and Chen method of two times the average p value, but they should be, they're usually pretty close. Okay, so what did I get? Oops, I got 0.89 for Q, from QVAL and 0.92 from so not too bad. Okay, so. 
let's start with the, well, the very first thing we should have a look at is the minimum p-value. Because that's going to tell us something about what these adjustment methods are going to do, right? So let's look at that. So I called my p-values p1sim, and I guess you all did too because you're following my code. Um, so let's look at min p1sim. So that seven zero is followed by a five. So the smallest one will pass the von Cohen adjustment. And that's kind of important to know because if that's even three, then no method is going to give you anything, right? Okay. So let's start by looking at uh, the significant features without any adjustment. So what I did here is uh, P1 less than 0.05 is just gives you 10,000 true and false, okay? And, these, and when you sum up trues and falses, it just gives you the total numbers of trues. Okay? So this will tell us, the top line will tell us how many discoveries we made. The second line will tell us how many false discoveries we made. And the third line will tell us Right, that's from, the, that's the last 1,000. That will tell us how many true discoveries we made. So we could try that. Yes? Uh, slightly off topic question. What do you do if your minimum p value You're asking if it whether it's getting close to floating point. Well, I've had P-values getting so close to floating point. Well, and nothing big. Well, they get, okay, so they get reported. Okay, so there's a couple of different pieces to this. So most programs, when they report the P-value, they round out up to some number of significant digits. So usually it's five or six. So if you actually have this number, this number, it's going to get reported as zero. That's okay. You can, you know, you can increase your precision of the printing, just the formatting of the question, to get it all if you care. But most of us don't care. Okay? I mean, we're really interested if it's 0.01 or 0.01, if it's close, and if it's less than that, we're happy. Okay? So I wouldn't worry about that so much. But there is this problem nowadays that we are looking at a lot of features, like, um, well, I don't know how many features you could have in proteomics. I guess if you looked at everything with the side chains and the little additional things, you could probably have millions of, of different features, right? Certainly, in gene expression, uh, if you look at exons instead of genes, you could have a couple of million features, or if you're looking at, um, called SNPs or other genetic variations, you could have five million, and then <coughs> this multiple over. Well, that's still well. That's still a number that's bigger than the machine precision, so you shouldn't have any problem. You will have a problem with the reported p value. It'll be wrong, but you know what? Out there, it's wrong anyway, because unless your data is Exactly normally distributed, that p value is just going to pop too much. Right. I'll ask you later. Yeah, I missed. I'm, did I well, miss I'm, you? I'm working with the features, I'm working with the hierarchical clusters that get into millions or millions of clusters of the data. So you're looking at tons of genes of these clusters of different things that are in different locations. And so I'm computing the p value. Oh, well, permutation, okay. I'm going to come to that later, but, well, actually, I'm not, I wasn't going to talk particularly about permutation. <coughs> permutation testing is problematic. And the problem, so let me explain this. So when you, 
So permutation testing, you don't assume that you know that the T test says has a T distribution. Uh, instead, what you do is you shuffle the samples around between treatments and control uh, as if there was no difference between treatment and control. And then you get a distribution for your test statistic, and you try to get a p-value from that. And so if you only have a thousand different ways you can shuffle the data, then you cannot get a p-value that's less than one over a thousand. And that means that when you start doing these adjustments, if you have, if you're dividing by 10,000 tests, you can never get significant. So that's a problem. Uh, and the only way you can deal with that problem is to have enough samples to do more permutation. So that's a different question. And then, okay, now this goes back to well, the one thing, but there's a question about posterior probability of some of this stuff. So although a frequentist would always say it doesn't matter if the p-value is smaller, you know, you have that's your chance of getting one is enough. But if you interpret things as posterior probability, then the ones that have smaller p-values are more likely. So if your adjusted p-values are all 1, or at least all over 0.05, then you say you have nothing significant, but you do the p-value histogram, and it looks like this histogram, except much more triangular, right, like that. So you don't have that sharp peak. That tells you why you didn't get anything significant after adjustment. but Still, you know that they're not all null because they're just not flat. Okay. So which ones are most likely to be non-null? Well, they're the ones with the smallest p-values. So what I would then do, if, if I have the resources to do it, is I start doing follow-up experiments, starting from the most significant ones, and try to figure out what the false detection rates really are by doing low throughput studies. This is very expensive. This is why you try not to. So that's what, I don't know if you have a better answer, but that's my answer. Well, that's a better, that's a better answer, but that's also expensive. Well, but then the second thing that might get more expensive is that you can add any order to like five to ten to fifteen. Like you pull up and pull down. Here there's a lot of them. And without the setting, you only get a small one, but then there's also the fact that you can all kinds of Factors. So 
That's a very good question. Um, so the question, the question essentially was: Suppose you reject a whole lot of things. Um, maybe you were anti-conservative, or um, maybe there's just a lot going on. Can you do something to pick the ones that are more interesting? Um, okay. Anyway, let's just finish this part off because we're close to the end. Okay. So where were we? We figured out that. Without adjustment, there were a thousand, in my case, eleven hundred um, rejections, which seems good because you know there should be a thousand rejections, right? But unfortunately, only seven hundred eighty-six of those were the ones that should have been rejected. The other three hundred forty-seven came from the null. So basically, one third of the ones that I rejected uh, are actually false rejections. So that's the problem. That's why we're going to do more. And presumably, everybody who did this part of the exercise got about the same thing. Right? Anybody get something wildly different from this? Yeah. Oh. You got 5,000? Well, Could you go up to the first? Okay. Um, type type M0. Oops. Did you get 9,000 for M0? <coughs> I mean, I should say today, after, in this current session. Because at one point, for the last little part of the talk, I wanted to talk about uh, what would happen if M0 was less than 50%. And so I put in 3,000. So somehow you seem to have picked up that code for me. So that how that happened. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, okay. So, the next thing we're going to do is look at the Von Froni correction. And if you looked at the minimum p value and it wasn't uh, smaller than 0.0005, then uh, you'll get zero at this step. So anyway, let's just see what happens here for me. So the bond for only correction, I just divide all the p-values by the number of features. Uh, well, two ways. I could either multiply the p-values by the number of features and pick the, the product that's less than 0.05, or I can divide and only pick up the features that have p-values less than the divi division divisor, which is what I did here. And um, 
Let's just run this little piece. So in this case, I got two significant genes, uh, proteins, uh, <coughs> which is a lot less than a thousand. And we could see which ones, whether they were true or false. So we'll look in the first 9,000. And they were all true discoveries, which is what you would hope for if you, um, you know, being that conservative. That's why you're that conservative. But there were 998 false non-discoveries. which would kind of upset me if I was looking at some process and trying to figure out what the proteins were and all that that's so important, right? So that's Bonferroni. That's why we don't use it anymore. Um, and then for the rest of it, it's actually easy to write your own when you're using a whole food routine, but we'll just use Peter to just. <coughs> um, so what this does is it creates the adjusted p-values, and then you see whether they're less than 0.05. So ben, this is Benjamin and Hochberg. It does not use M0, it uses M. So it found 5, which is better than 2. And it looked at, again, I looked at the true alternatives, and all five of them were in the true alternatives, this would make me very happy. Uh, but, you know, all of you should be doing this in parallel, and 5% of us should get some that are in the middle. I mean, sorry, that were from the null. So you can't be guaranteed that this one you would have this. And what would happen if I divided by, if I asked for adjusted Benjamin and Hochberg? Well, it would be I would get a few extras, um, and it would, I'd have to use my estimated M0, right, which might not be quite right. Uh, so my experience, so this sounds like the kind of thing nobody would bother to do research on, but anyway, part of my research was on estimating uh, pi zero, and basically what I discovered is if pi zero is close say 0.95 or more, it's not worth estimating. Okay. So you can tell that just by looking at the p-value histogram, whether you want to use adjusted Benjamin or Hochberg or what you want. And that's because of the variability of your estimate. So you introduce other errors and you just mess yourself up. Okay. So that's Benjamin and Hochberg. And then we'll go down to q-values. Well, yeah, basically what happens, Q values become a little liberal and you get more false discoveries than you expect if pi zero is close to one. So here's the Q values. Remember my Q value, I got very close to 0.9 for my estimate of pi zero. Oops, I didn't like that. Q1 sim. I'm in the wrong code chunk. Okay. So now I got 16. For some reason, I reversed this. This is from the alternatives. None of them were in the alternatives. Sorry, none of them were in the null. So all of the 16 are true discoveries. Yes? For the Benjamin and Hochberg, you get five by throwing the angle among the null? Okay, I see it. Like I said, I didn't do this the same way. Okay. Very yes, bad. Yes, yes. Pedagogically, I made a, an error here. These are all alternatives, so all five are from alternatives. These are the null, yes. so none of them are from the null. Really 
very good question. Oh, local FDR. <coughs> so local FDR. Okay. So Oops, no. Nope. Let's go back to here. So this is how FDR looks. Works. FDR says if I reject right here, which I, I compute that point by computing the adjusted p value, but we could go back from the adjustments to say what p value did I actually reject at, right? So if I start here, it's the FD, the q value or the Benjamin Newton Hoffberg adjusted p value is the percentage of all of these rejections portion of all these rejections that are false rejections. Local is like if I just if I look at this and it's right beside it. Uh, the difference between those. So it's kind of like it's a it's a little snapshot of the difference between sort of adjacent bars on this Histogram. Um, so let's see. It's got an interpretation. As interpreted. Proportion in this in this little bar. Going back to this question of, of you know, which, where you do the cutoff, for example, uh, given this sort of Bayesian interpretation of the percentage, the, the probability that something you rejected is a false rejection, okay? um, ordinary FDR says from this point and smaller, it's a proportion of all of them that are false rejections, but obviously each bar has a different proportion of false rejections. This, in this bar, the false rejections are what's below my hand, and the true rejections are above, so the proportion is small. But out here, the proportion is pretty big compared to this bar. So local FDR is that. Okay. But the estimate, is there something besides F1's estimate? Yeah, so. The only thing I can say about it is it provides some justification for this idea that if you have nothing significant, you start from the most significant ones, uh, the smallest p value, and you start testing there because the local FDR is higher. Well, I don't agree with that. Where it came
It depends. And a useful plot, which is the plot I was going to sh show just for q-values, but you can do this for any, is to plot the adjusted p-values versus the p-values. So, um, so let's do that for the q-values. Uh, let's see. I can never remember what's in here. q1, sim, what are the components called? Oops. q1, sim. Okay, so we have the q-values and the p-values. So... What I will plot is uh, P Q1 sim roller. P values on the x axis and Q1 sim roller. Q values on the y axis. Oops, no, that's right. P values on the x. And what you can see, first of all, is that the Q values climb up to 1 pretty fast. But down here, where you really care, Q is 0.2 here, but P is 0.2. So you see that the Q values are bigger. Well, let me add the line. Uh, this should be, if I did this right, the line y equals x. Nope. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So the q values are above the line. They're bigger than the p values. And that's what you expect because you, want, you expect fewer significant genes when you do two, fewer significant features after you do the adjustment. You had a question? Pardon me? That's not true, they're not going to work for that. So, uh, 
I don't think I'll be able to <laughs> read it in time, but <laughs> but send me the link and I'll have a look. Okay, so what I would suggest that people do now, it, you should have all the code there, just go up and change the 9,000 to 3,000 and get right down to the very end, which you could do by running the whole thing. Um, and then look at this plot. So let's see, where are we? Generating the data, simulating the data. OK. So right up here, I'm going to change this to 3,000. And then I'm going to just run everything. Uh, so uh, depending on whether you're on a Mac or a Windows machine, you can step through. Is it, in order to get it in the console, which you'll need to get this plot, um, you need to run through the chunks one at a time so that they come up here. So uh, what I do is I usually use run <coughs> next code chunk, and I just start at the top and just run through them. Okay, so for me, let me now do this again. Plot two, one, two, four, two, four. Okay, well, in this case, I guess I didn't make it extreme enough, but you can, you can have cases where the Q values are actually smaller than the P values. And when that happens, what should you do? Well, that's the false discovery rate. So just imagine if everything was a true discovery, then you couldn't make any mistakes with the false discovery. Uh, and so your false discovery rate is going to be really small. So I would say if the Q value or your adjusted P value is actually smaller than your P value, I would use the P values and then I would report the adjusted P value that corresponds to P equals 0.05 because that's what you expect your false discovery rate to be at 0.05. So say that Q value or or Benjamin Hochberg adjusted p-value is 0.01, that says that when you reject for p less than 0.05, you expect only 1% of those rejections to be false. That makes sense, right? If you do it the other way around and you reject at your adjusted p-value less than 0.05 and your p-value is 0.3, that says that you're rejecting um, hypotheses for which, under the null, you expect to see something this extreme 3% of the time, that, I mean 30% of the time. To me, that doesn't make sense. And this happens when pi 0 is very small. Uh, in my particular case, it didn't happen here, but 30, 30% uh, nulls is usually enough to make that happen. Okay, let's take a 
ten minute break and I'll That's so you know, really work the way you usually are done like Wait, wait, wait. I, I'm sorry. I can't let you go yet. <laughs> and the reason is, that, and the reason is because I had thought that I had this extra time, and I have to show you some other p-value histograms because you're going to see them, and you're going to wonder what's going on. So let me, it'll be very quick. I promise. Five minutes. Uh, <laughs> you've heard that before, right? <laughs> of course, I have to find. Okay, let's get rid of our studio. Don't save. Uh, more multiple testing. <coughs> Slide show. Okay, so this is what they're supposed to look like. And this is what they looked like in this particular study. And I already showed you this one. So this is just total garbage, and I already talked about that. This came from another microarray study, and how did this happen? Well, the problem is that there's this dip where there shouldn't be. And th there's two possibilities, okay? so. Well, there's more than two possibilities. Nobody really knows why this happens, but you do see this happening, okay? Um, so if all the tests are correlated, these all I did was I took this exact same simulation you just ran. I, I made high zero, uh, M0, 10,000, okay? So none of them, they're all null. Um, but I created correlation among all the features. And these are different runs from the exact same code. The p-values look awful, okay? So one possibility for this histogram is that these tests were correlated. That is, the features were correlated. So they came from a gene network. But I don't think that's the case because actually this is one set of data and it was um, basically leaves were collected from the plants and then the, um, and the gene expression in the leaves was um, was measured, and then the plants were exposed to different pathogens. And these are uh, tests based on the unexposed leaves, um, but the response two groups created by whether they were resistant or not to the pathogen. So these are exactly the same gene expression values, so they can't be correlated in one case and not in the other. Okay, um, and here they look fine, and here they don't. And I think it was had something to do with selection bias because the leaves that were selected were selected from plants that were sensitive or not sensitive to this pathogen. But anyway, so that's one thing that can go wrong. The other thing has to do with count data, which of course sometimes we get intensity data, but sometimes we get count data. So this is what can, these are simulated data. This is what it looks like with continuous data. This is what it looks like with count data. You get these little peaks and you always get this peak at one and this comes from the fact that some features have low expression and therefore low counts and therefore you're doing a test where under the null, well under any distribution, you know, okay suppose you have treatment and control and you only see four of whatever it is you're counting. Well, it's either 0, 4, 1, 3, 2, 2, right? So there's only a limited number of p-values you could get. And these peaks here come from those p-values, from those low expression features. Um, and you'll notice that, so the red were under the alternative. There's quite a few reds in this, p equals 1. And this happens with real, this is simulated data, but here's real data. Um, this, this is microarray data here. Sorry, this is not microarray data. These are two different um, comparisons from some liver RNA-seq data. Um, and this is what it looks like. 
if you filter out the very low expressing genes or the things you have low detection, it'll, you get a little better. This thing goes down and then you can see this peak here. But it turns out that all these multiple testing adjustments actually still continue to work. Uh, but it is better to filter the data a little bit to get rid of these things. If, if you only see one, you know, one of something, then how can you say that that says there's a difference between the treatment and the control, right? If it's very low expressing it, and they're equal, it's equally likely to be one in the treatment or one in the control. You can't say it's significant. Um, and here's another example where we uh, took out uh, count, we only picked up the counts that were bigger than the ATM. So that's, those are the two things I wanted to, to show you. Uh, so with low counts, you usually filter before you do any multiple testing, and that makes sense from the biological point of view as well, because it's hard, if something's close to detection level, it's hard to tell if it's differential or just noise. That's it.